It all starts with a blank canvas. Whether you create with a brush, your voice, your eyes, your mind, we all start at the same place, with an idea. Ideas can be played out in your mind from start to finish. You can poke holes in them, you can change them. But at some point, you need to take those ideas, no matter how raw they actually are, and put pen to paper. Because once you start to create, the world around you fades away, and all that matters right here, right now, is your art. So what are you waiting for? Jared Poland, Fronos Photo. Dot com and this is the real world review of the Canon EOS R5. Now the whole point of doing a real world review is to get out into the real world to do an actual real world photo shoot. In this case, I hooked up and connected with my friend Jeremy Ville, who is an illustrator and artist out of New York, Philadelphia, Australia, the entire world, to go into the studio to capture him doing his art. Now, my focus was to do high ISO tests, low ISO tests. Could we do some close focusing? Could we adapt some lenses? How does the camera work in this real world situation? Can it handle it? Can it not handle it? Well, that's what we're about to find out. Jeremy's studio is really cool. On one side of it, you have a bunch of windows letting in natural light. And while you're in that area, closer to the windows, he has his painting set up. It's a long table with his art right there, with him ready with everything that he needs to paint, to draw, to illustrate. He has that there. But then in the back of the studio, there is not a lot of natural light. So that gave us a great opportunity to capture some low light candid images. To start off the photo shoot with Jeremy, I decided to choose the 28 to 70 F2. Now there's no rhyme or reason why I chose to do that, but I think it comes down to, it gave me a little bit of the ability to get wide. It allowed me to zoom in if I wanted, but also that F2, it allows me to isolate Jeremy even if there's out of focus things in the foreground. The camera uses a newly designed 45 megapixel CMOS sensor. Now is 45 too much? Is it too little? We know that Sony has a 61 megapixel sensor in their A7R4. Is 45 good? I think 45 is a pretty good sweet spot because as you'll see later on in this real world review, you're gonna get a lot of frames per second, which means you're moving a ton of data off of a 45 megapixel sensor and it doesn't slow down. But there is something that some people may not be happy with is you can't dumb down the RAW file. Canon doesn't have in there the ability to do RAW small or RAW medium, it's just RAW. Am I upset about that? No, because if you're gonna shoot RAW, just shoot the highest RAW quality possible. And I quickly realized that I wanted to go wider and 15 to 35 isn't wide enough. That's a cool lens and all as part of the Hebrew Trinity, though I prefer to have 11 to 24, 24 to 70, and 70 to 200. I decided to go with the 11 to 24 to get a environmental portrait that showcased the entire table and Jeremy working. See, when I'm doing environmental portraits, I like to go wide. I like to show the subject working as well as show their entire environment. And in this case, I was able to use an adapted lens with the adapter, no problems with autofocus at all to get the shot that I was looking for, which is this ultra wide shot. Now the question is, do you go with the color to go with the black and white. In this case, I thought the black and white was best. The processor that you will find inside of this camera is borrowed from the 1DX Mark III. It's the Digic X processor, even though Canon tells us not to call it the Digic 10. Every Digic processor has been called a number. So this one is going to be the Digic 10, at least for this real world review. What that means is you have the same processor from a more expensive camera inside of this camera, which is gonna help move all of that data around much quicker and help you get better quality images. 
Now let's talk about the RF mount. This is one thing that Canon got right before they ever got the bodies right. They had great RF lenses out first, AKA 51.2, 85 1.2, 70 to 200, 15 to 35, a 28 to 70 F2, a 24 to 70 2.8, the whole Hebrew Trinity. They got out a lot of great glass and then they even got out some interesting stuff like a 600 F11 that I thought would be weird and 800 F11 that I also thought would be weird, but check out my review of those. They actually turned out to be pretty fun to use, but there are still some holes in their lineup. I had to use an 11 to 24 that was adapted for this real world review to get the ultra wide. 15 is wide, but 11 is a lot wider and I need that wideness when I want to shoot. I also would like to have something like a 35-1-2 because I have a Sigma 35-1-2 on my Sony's when I'm shooting Sony. And to mention Sony again, they have a 12 to 24 2.8. So it's going to be interesting to see if Canon has something that's going to best that, like a 12 to 24 F2 or an 11 to 24 2.8. We'll have to see what they come out with. But the last thing about the lens mount is will they open it up to third party manufacturers? Will you see Tamron lenses? Will you see Sigma lenses? If they can figure that out, there might be some really good Sigma glass coming or some really good Tamron glass that you can save money on and still get quality images. So what lenses did I bring for this real world review? Well, I brought the entire new Hebrew Trinity, which is the 15 to 35 2.8, the 24 to 70 2.8, the 70 to 200 2.8. I brought the 50 1.2, the 85 1.2, not the DS version, just the regular 85 1.2, and also two lenses that required an adapter. That's the 100 millimeter macro, as well as the 11 to 24 to give me an ultra wide angle shot, even though that is an F4 lens. I think one of the biggest questions that I got asked time and time again with the new EOS R5 is how does it adapt EF lenses with the adapter? Not how does it physically do it, but does it work? Does autofocus work with those EF lenses? Well, I took it out to shoot football players, AKA quarterbacks throwing the ball and running around, and I used a third-party lens, a 70-200 2.8 Sigma, as well as a Canon 400 2.8 version two, because there's no 400 2.8 RF or 300 2.8 RF just yet. So I adapted those lenses to the R5 and they worked really well with lock on tracking for face detection as well as IAF. Now I didn't feel like I was missing out on any images because I was waiting for the focus to catch up. It's fast, it's active, it works really well. The only problem is when you wanna switch from EF lenses to RF lenses, you kind of forget to take the adapter off or you're trying to adapt this, it's kind of a pain in the ass. I, I think a recommendation for me is if you have a lot of EF glass and you don't want to switch off to RF lenses just yet, but you want an RF mirrorless body, maybe think about investing in a $99 adapter for your main go-to lenses so you don't try to take an EF lens like I did and shove it into an RF mount and almost ruin the camera. One issue that I encountered pretty quick during the photo shoot had nothing to do with the camera at all. It was the fact that I was wearing a mask and when I breathed, it fogged up my electronic viewfinder. So how did I get around that? I just held the camera just a smidgen further away from my eye than I normally did. And by the end of the shoot, I didn't even realize that I was doing it because I was no longer fogging up the EVF. This is the new reality, at least right now. Wear a mask when you're out there shooting. I wear it to protect the other people and they wear them to help protect me. After getting the wider environmental portrait, I decided to switch to the 15 to 35 just to move over to the side because we have the window light to my back lighting up Jeremy as he's got this profile shot going and that had some awesome contrast. So having the 15 to 35, I could start off wider and then zoom in and reach out and grab more of a tighter shot. That's where the 15 to 35 range comes into play. Generally speaking, you would need to have a 24 to 70 on if you wanted to do that, or you would have an 11 to 24 and be done at 24. Now in this specific situation, the 15 to 35 helped me get some really cool shots of Jeremy painting. 
How many frames per second do you think you can shoot at 45 megapixels? Well, you can get 12 frames per second with the mechanical shutter and 20 frames per second with the electronic shutter. Now you can get 180 RAW files when you are shooting to the CF Express card without filling up the buffer, and you can only get 87 when using the SD card alone. But keep in mind, I like to shoot redundant, so I want to save the RAW files to both of those cards, which means you're going to dumb it down to only getting 87 to the CF Express card as well as to the SD card if you're using them for redundancy at the same time. The truth of the matter is, even when shooting football at 20 frames per second, I did not outrun the buffer having two cards in the camera, so I don't think this is a major deal. But keep in mind, if you want to get those 12 frames per second and those 20 frames per second, you need to use the latest battery that Canon offers in order to get that frame rate. Whatever Canon has done with their shutter technology is pretty impressive because even when you're shooting with the shutter mode and not electronic shutter, the camera is pretty damn quiet. That shutter is almost silent. It's almost like they have a pillow inside of this thing where the shutter hits and it's like, oh, I'm so soft and I'm so quiet and it's like you could sleep with me, but it's so quiet. Good on you, Canon, for putting a quiet shutter in there. Let me jump in here real quick because I want to show you something in Lightroom with this photo that was taken from the Canon R5. Now, this isn't edited at all, but I want to show you it working with 10 of our presets from Fropac 2, starting with ACDC. One click, look what it did. Then I go down to Apollo with no white balance, Bob Ross for people, Burnt Sienna, one of my favorites, Charlie Brown, then Charmin, Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Actually, all of the Cinnamon Toast Crunches that we include here, high contrast and high contrast to all work as well. Double stuffed Oreos for a really cool black and white. Then we go down to Golden Grams, which I really love how Golden Grams works on this one. And then we've got Matte Black. There's three different versions that we include here in Matte Black. That one works, High Contrast works, and so does Low Contrast. The whole point of me showing you this is that these presets that we created give you a great starting point and also save you a lot of time when you are editing your RAW files. If you want to go ahead and check them out, head on over to fronosphoto.com slash fropack2. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters and if you decide to pick them up right now they are currently on sale or if you pick up fro pack one and fro pack two as the fro pack bundle you can save even more now let's get back to the video since i already had the 15 to 35 on and i already used the 11 to 24 to get that close wide environmental portrait i wanted to step back and show more of the studio. So when I stepped back, I had more of the tables and more of the art in the image. And after I got this one back into the computer, I was having trouble between black and white and color. And the reason I chose to go with color is because you could see some of his other artwork on the table that's up close on the right hand side. There's awesome colors in that. You've got the colors of his little statue thing that he built off to the right hand side. And I just felt that color was the right choice for that image. One of the biggest issues with the Canon EOS R when you were shooting multiple frames in a row was it seemed that it was herky-jerky because the preview of the last image stayed up in the viewfinder. Now with most cameras, you get some blackout. You take a picture, the shutter comes down, you see that blackout and you can kind of see through it and it's not herky-jerky, but the EOS R was. So a lot of people asked, does the R5 have that same issue as the EOS R? And the answer, is no. When I'm shooting 12 frames a second, 7 frames a second, you can see a quick preview of the image before, but there is no noticeable blackout and no noticeable issue that is herky-jerky. Now you can see this on the screen where we put the EOS R5 up against the A7R4 as well as the Z7, and you can determine which one you think is the best or which one is the worst. In my opinion, I think they're all fine, and the EOS R5 is the one that doesn't have the blackout, and it doesn't have any herky-jerky feel, so you're gonna be fine shooting with this, you're not gonna miss anything, and you'll be able to track your subject no matter how many frames a second you are shooting.
The max shutter speed is 1 8,000th of a second. Now that comes in handy when you're using one of those 1-2 lenses outside and want to shoot a shallow depth of field at 1.2 at say 100 ISO. But what you can't do is go past 1 8,000th of a second even when you're using the electronic shutter. Now the Sony A9 and A9 II allow you to go well beyond the 1 8,000th of a second. I was at 1 32,000th of a second at some point using the electronic shutter. That's something I would like to see Canon add to the EOS R5 or future cameras is the ability to get faster shutter speeds so I can utilize the 1.2 lenses even outside in bright daylight and maybe shoot at 1 32,000th or 1 40,000th of a second. Since we've had this camera for a couple of months, we've done a lot of different tests. And throughout this review, you're gonna see us call back to those tests. And one of them that we did was the EOS R5 versus the A7R4 in a portrait setting with the same exact subject in the same spot, with the same settings, with very similar angles where we used 85-1.2 on the Canon and the 85-1.4 Sigma on the Sony. And with the Sony, you can see you have more megapixels. So when you zoom in, you can go further and it's super duper clear. But even with the 45 megapixels of the R5, it still allows you to go in really far. You have a lot of resolution and it is super duper sharp with that RF lens. So is there a major difference that I can just see looking at them side by side? No, not really. It's just a matter of which skin tone do you like? But at the end of the Day when you get the RAW file, you can get basically the same color with both of these cameras. As I always say, I want to get the wides, the mediums, the tights, and the details. So I switched off to the 85 1.2 because I saw Jeremy's sketchbook was open on the desk in front of him when he was painting, and I wanted to get just the sketchbook, and that's why I used the 85 to shoot down on that one. Since I already got some wides and some medium shots as well as some details, I wanted to move to the side with that 85 on there to get Jeremy really focused as he got up and close and personal with the details in the artwork. One of the things you'll notice about Jeremy is that he pretty much always has on his sunglasses. Now they are prescription sunglasses, but this is integral to his look. It's part of his persona. So was I gonna have issues with IAF because he was wearing the glasses? I thought that I might, but I didn't have any issues because everything was nice and tack sharp. The focus still went to where the eye was going to be or where the eye actually is behind those glasses. And I still got some really nice images. When he wants to get in close to those details, he takes his glasses off. And I'm really happy that I had IAF still on because it just found his eye and I was able to get the composition just right with the paintbrush out of focus in the foreground and the focus right on Jeremy focusing on his art. This camera utilizes dual pixel AF2. Canon has done a fantastic job with dual pixel over the years since they introduced it. Now in the EOS R5, you have 100% viewfinder coverage, which means your thousand plus autofocusing points stretch all the way to the ends of the frame, the top, the bottom, the left, and the right. Even when I was shooting sports, if a subject was all the way off to the left-hand side, at the furthest reaches, the autofocusing points went out there. Now, is the dual pixel AF as good as Sony's autofocusing system with their lock-on tracking and their IAF. What I will say is I didn't expect Canon's to be as good as it actually is. It is pretty darn close to being as good as Sony's, if not on par. Now I say that because I've used the Sony's for a lot longer than I've used the Canon, but in my real world usage for the last couple months using the EOS R5, it's done very well. Here's an example showing you how the IAF of the R5 compares to the A7R4 as well as the Nikon Z7. You can see that the Canon and the Sony are fantastic. The Nikon is lagging a little behind but has done much better than where it started out. And what's interesting is to see that it's hard to determine which is better between the Sony and the Canon. So you have the footage to look at, which one do you think is better? In one of my first autofocusing tests, I took little Dan out into the garden 
to try and photograph him either running so I could get lock on tracking or using the 85 at 1.2 to try and get a nice portrait. Now this kid runs around, he eats a lot of donuts, okay? He drinks a lot of juice, so he has a lot of energy, but also he's a kid and it's difficult to be able to move focusing points quickly yourself manually to the eye, get the picture before the kid runs away. In this shot, you can see how he's out of the frame. He comes into the frame, it finds the eye. I lop off one or two or three shots and bam, I ended up getting the shot that I would have otherwise not have been able to get if I had to rely on manually moving the focusing points. I love photographing with Animal IAF, but after I went to the zoo and then decided to go test out IAF for football players to try and get some action, I didn't realize until after that shoot was over that the IAF was still on Animal Detect IAF. I thought I was on the right mode to track people and I had issues trying to track them when shooting football because it was just looking for a smaller portion of the eye and it wasn't overriding to face detect when it couldn't find the eye. The truth is those pictures actually turned out pretty good but it didn't give me what I wanted and when I realized that I made the mistake I had to go back and shoot it again. The reason I made the mistake is I didn't realize that the IAF for animals was still active in the camera. There was no icon that popped up on the back of the screen or in my electronic viewfinder to let me know that animal mode is still on. And there's no quick button to press that turns it off and deactivates it and puts it back into human IAF. So my recommendation to you is if you photograph more people and for one time you photograph animals, make sure you get in the habit of turning it back to people IAF so you don't make the same mistake that I did. I'm a big fan of using out of focus areas in a frame to draw you in to the subject. For example, there's the black cup on Jeremy's desk that's out of focus, but we're drawn in to the image. Or he's got the black cup, he's got his book open, and he's just framed by the paints and all of these things that draw you in to him as the subject. So when you're out there photographing in a 3D world, knowing that a camera captures things in two dimensions, if you can add dimension to an image by using out of focus things that are either closer or further away from the frame to draw you in, then you're gonna get some winning images. Now my thinking on deciding which camera systems to go with does start with which cameras give me the better autofocus. Can I rely fully and solely on the dual pixel AF or the lock on tracking of the Sony to give me the shots that I need where I can rely on the camera to get shots that I otherwise would have missed if I didn't have that technology. And I think I can tell you that Canon is at that point. In my shooting of sports, I used face detect, I used eye detect, Detect, and the camera performed flawlessly when tracking football players running down the field. The IAF for animals at the zoo did a fantastic job finding the eyes of the animals, even though they weren't moving very fast or very far. That's why I photograph sports, to show you that this camera is capable of doing that. And when it comes to portraits, being able to shoot at 85, 1.2, or any lens at 1.2 and get tack sharp images on the eye reliably without me having to move the focusing points tells me that this dual pixel AF2 system is fantastic and I can fully rely on it to get the shots that I otherwise would have missed. Let me jump in here and let you know that this video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your very own online portfolio, use what I use for jaredpolen.com and get your 14 day free trial over at squarespace.com slash Frono's photo. Now, if you decide that it's for you, use the code Frono's photo at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Now, let's get back to the video. So let's talk about the R5's body. 
Now it's very similar to what you would have seen with the EOS R, but they did make some tweaks. They got rid of that stupid touch bar that nobody actually liked. I actually hated it and said, why do you have a touch bar? So they got rid of it. They must have listened to me. They added back the scroll wheel, which a lot of people love and has been on a ton of Canon cameras, as well as adding back the joystick. So you have a joystick for moving your focusing points, but why doesn't it have the smart controller of the 1DX Mark III? And I think to answer that, I will just say, because you can activate the touch panel LCD screen to be the joystick. Your thumb can work on it and just move the focusing points accurately and quickly to exactly where you want them to be. I would have liked to have seen them give me the option for the touch sensitive button, but that it's not there is not that big of a deal. I don't think you need the joystick because you have the ability to do touch and drag AF and you can even change the speed at which the focusing points move. So I find myself from time to time needing to move them quickly because there's so many focusing points and the joystick just isn't as fast as me just putting my thumb on the back of the screen while I'm shooting and moving the focusing point and tweaking it to exactly where I want it to be. So I love having that feature in this camera. If you're like me and you find that your massive hands have trouble holding the camera, well, you can always get a vertical grip. Now, Canon offers two vertical grips. One is an extra battery pack that allows you to put two batteries in it, but also has a joystick and all the buttons to shoot, unlike Nikon, who doesn't have a grip that does anything functionality. And you thought I wasn't gonna rip on Nikon in a Canon video, now didn't you? Well, I just did. Now, there is a second grip, but it is only available for the R5. What it does is it allows extra connectivity for those sports shooters who need to transfer via ethernet or something along those lines, but it will run you a thousand bucks. I recommend the vertical grip because you get two extra batteries, it's bigger, it's easier to handhold, and if you get an R6 to go along with your R5, that grip will work on both systems. Oh yeah, as a bonus, when you go vertical, even without the grip, the viewfinder, the EVF, actually moves where the data is so that your shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, or whatever, is now down at the bottom of the viewfinder so that when you rotate back this way, it rotates, unlike other systems that you have to look through and then try to read everything vertically, this puts it right there. So the body feels great in the hands, it feels substantial, it's built really well, and it's just a nice upgrade or an update from the EOS R with the features that a lot of people love in older Canon cameras. Next up, I switched over to the 70-200 RF. I personally hate the fact that it extends out the way that it extends out, but it is super small in the bag and doesn't take up a lot of space. But this lens can help me zoom in and reach out and grab those details that I can do from more of a distance without having to get up close to bother the subject. So I focused in on Jeremy's hands. Look at the ink on his hands. It's cool that you picked that up. They're not clean hands, they're working hands of an artist, but also look at the pen. See, that's where I chose to focus in right there on the pen. I switched over to the single point continuous AF because I didn't need lock on tracking or face detect because there were no faces to detect, but I wanted one single point to put it exactly where I wanted so I could get the focus on the pen and capture a unique image. This is the first Canon camera to offer you IBIS, or in-body image stabilization. Now, when you pair it with one of the ISRF lenses, you are getting eight stops of image stabilization. Now, this is some of the best IBIS that we've seen across the board in any camera that offers image stabilization. And all of the video that you see throughout this shoot is shot handheld with IBIS on. It's so good that it's almost gimbal-like. So remember the black mug on the table? Well, taking just a close-up of that mug with nothing else in the frame, it could be interesting in a photo story, but maybe not to stand on its own. But if I go vertical and put that off in the bottom corner and have that in focus, but you can tell that Jeremy is painting in the background and he's out of focus, that makes for an interesting image. So I was able to do that with the 70 to 200. Focus on the mug and then Jeremy in the background painting, he's still there, you know it's him. So it created some interesting dynamic in the final image.
Let me jump in here real quick and say, would you like me to send you this free guide to capturing motion in low light situations? Well, if you said yes, just look for this orange box over on the website, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, and I will send you that guide for free. The native ISO is 100 to 51,200. Now, I'm not gonna get into the expanded ISO because you should never really need to go into that mode because if you're going that high, higher than 51,200, you're probably shooting in pitch black. The Canon R5 utilizes a 5.76 million dot electronic viewfinder with 120 frames per second refresh rate. Now it is one of the best EVFs that I've ever used and the best that I've ever used, I think is the Panasonic S1, which is also 5.76 million dots. That one's super clear and super clean, but I do like the Canons in comparison to any of the Sony ones on the market, including the nine point however million dot EVF that they put in the A7S III. I just feel that the Canon is super clear, super sharp. It is a really nice EVF that it's almost like you're not looking at an EVF, but you're looking into the real world. It's kind of like a window, which is the marketing that Sony used with the A7S III. Now, the only issue that I found that Nikon gets pretty right is there's an auto brightness feature that if it's super bright outside, it may brighten up the viewfinder, or if it's dark, it may lighten up the viewfinder so you can compensate and get a better exposure because sometimes I find that the way that it just stays right in the middle, if it's super bright outside, my eye gets thrown off, or if it's super dark, my eye's getting thrown off and I'm trying to overcompensate and I find that I may be off by a half a stop to a full stop and I like being being much closer with my exposure. Is it a deal breaker? No, it's just something that I need to get used to doing so that I can get my exposures more spot on. I'm really happy where Jeremy was set up to paint because we had the light coming in from the side to light up his profile. So that created some nice contrast and dimension because if I was shooting from the other side, shooting into the window light, you might get more of that hazy look. Now, I know some people like that when it comes to shooting weddings, but I personally hate it even when it comes to shooting weddings because I don't like lens flare in my images and I don't like the lack of contrast. But on this side with the light at my back and Jeremy at a 90 degree angle, the contrast of these images just pop off the screen. There's a 3.2 inch vary angle touch screen, which is very bright, very vibrant, great colors, great saturation, nice sharpness, and it employs that vary angle, which I personally don't give a shit about when it comes to shooting stills. In fact, I don't care about it when it comes to video because you're not vlogging with this camera for the most part. Sure, it may come into play if you're standing behind it and you wanna have it off to the side for whatever reason or try it at a different angle when you're shooting video, but when you're shooting stills, I actually found that it's much harder to get straighter angles if you hold it above your head. Because what happens is the screen doesn't open to like 180 degrees. It's actually a little short of that. So when you're holding it up over your head and it's tilted, your angles are totally off. I rather have it go back to the one that is flush to the back of the camera that you can just tilt down and then you can see that your lines are straight. You hold it up, you hold it down, you tilt the screen this way, you tilt the screen this way, and I feel that is much better. That's of course not a deal breaker. A lot of people want that rotatable screen, but I could do without it. We all know that I love shooting redundant, AKA having multiple card slots inside of a camera. And this camera is no exception because it has two slots, one CF Express and one SD, which is a UHS-2 card slot. Now, personally, I rather have two of the same, two CF Express card slots inside of a camera so that when I'm shooting redundant, it doesn't dumb down the speed to the slowest card. Now, speaking of redundancy, it will do redundant recording for photos but it doesn't do redundant recording for video. There's other cameras out in the world that will do dual recording for video. Same thing to card one, same thing to card two. Now, could they put a CF Express type B card in as well as a type A card in, even though A is slightly slower? but still faster than SD. Maybe that's something they do in the future, but I prefer having two of the same card slots in any camera that I'm shooting with. 
So I could keep shooting for hours and hours, but if I keep doing that, I'll get the same picture over and over. So I had Jeremy go to this big mural that he had painted on paper against the back wall. Now he was still at a 90 degree angle from the light coming in, so I set up to do those portraits. Now setting up is me just walking over, picking the lens that I wanted and you know, focusing and composing him. But what was interesting is that the IAF found the eye in the painting behind him. So I just had to use my thumb on the screen to move it back to him and then it found him and locked in on him for each one of those portraits. To switch it up after getting some of those portraits, I wanted to focus in on Jeremy's pen. You know, that's his tool as an artist. So I had him hold it out to me. I had the 51.2 on there and I was trying to get the tip of the pen and I ran into issues because I was still on face detect, eye detect, and it was looking all around. And all I wanted to focus in on was just the tip. I wanted just the tip in focus, so I switched over to the single autofocusing point in continuous focus, locked in on the tip, took the picture, got that shot, but what's also cool is you can see the details of the paint on the hand as well. So the 50 worked pretty good, but I remembered I have a 100 millimeter macro in the bag that's really an EF lens that I have to adapt with an adapter to the RF camera. So I switched over to that to get macro shots. So I did run into a slight issue with the 100 macro. It was hunting quite a bit. Now, is that because it's an older lens and it's an EF adapted lens? It eventually did exactly what I wanted it to do, but this tells me that Canon needs to come out with an RF 105 macro or a 100 macro or an 85 macro. Then, and by the way, we actually do have a 35 1.8 macro. I just totally forgot that we left that at the studio because I didn't even remember that we had it. Now Jeremy held up the paintbrush because that's something he uses as well. And I was able to isolate just the paintbrush vertically with Jeremy in the background, out of focus, but also horizontally so I could get different type of images. Now, when I'm shooting these photo stories, I'm thinking about the photo book that I could make after the fact. Sometimes I want a two page spread that's horizontal. Other times I want a picture for the back of the book or maybe the front of the book. And that's why I would go with a vertical. Let me jump in here to remind you that the super huger mega camera giveaway is still going on right now, where I'm giving one of you a chance to win a camera and lenses valued up to $4,999, and it's absolutely free to enter. Head on over to bit.ly slash megafro2020 right now, but if you would like to pick up FroPack 1, FroPack 2, or the FroPack bundle, or any of my video guides, you can score extra entries towards winning this contest. Now keep in mind, you do not need to make a purchase to win the grand prize. The standard video recording mode for this camera is 4K at 30 frames per second. But if you wanna get the best of the best with honors, sir, you can shoot the 4K HQ mode, which is downsampled from 8K to give you really sharp 4K. Right now we're shooting with the Canon EOS R5 in the highest quality 4K, which is 4K HQ in C-Log, which gives us 10-bit 422. However, if you're looking for high frame rate 4K, you can shoot at 120 frames per second, but it does come with a caveat that it does introduce some line skipping. Now Canon chose not to give users a one-to-one -one pixel readout due to that high frame rate. The footage may not be as sharp, but as you saw from our footage earlier, it is perfectly acceptable. Although you can get 120p in 4K, you can't get 1080 at 120p yet. Though Canon does promise at some point they will have a firmware which gives you that option. Why that wasn't in the box at launch, I don't know. Now, all of these recording modes are available in 10-bit 422 as long as you are using Canon Log, aka C-Log, or HDRPQ. Or if you stick with the standard picture styles, it will dumb it down to 8-bit 420, which looks to be perfectly fine unless you're gonna do some heavy grading. The R5 shoots 12-bit 8K raw video with the full width of the sensor. Now there is a caveat, you must use a CF Express card because it is moving a ton 
of data. A lot of people think that 8K is stupid to have in a camera. Now it's not about delivering 8K footage so that you post it in 8K. It's about having the ability to punch in closer to me, but to keep going further and further and further and still have it be super sharp and super clear. It also comes in handy if you're shooting a video and you have one angle for two people. You could crop into the person on the left, crop into the person on the right. You could pan across with the 8K. That's where 8K comes in handy. This clip was shot in 8K RAW. Now, one thing we wish the camera had was 4K raw video internal. Now, if you can do 8K internal, I don't know why they don't have the option for 4K, but maybe that's something they can unlock in the future with a firmware update because 4K raw would be a much smaller file size in comparison to 8K raw. To put 8K raw file sizes into perspective on a 128 gigabyte card, do you know how much time you get, anybody? Bueller? Anybody else watching out there? Just a little bit over five minutes. And if you had a one terabyte card, you are chewing up one terabytes of data in roughly 50 minutes of shooting 8K RAW. That's a lot of data. Now we all know Canon took a bunch of heat no pun intended, for the fact that this camera overheats quite a bit. Now, I do blame Canon's marketing of this camera for bringing a lot of that heat to them. The reason is they marketed it as, oh my God, we're gonna do amazing cinematic things. We're gonna shoot 8K. When the fact of the matter is, the 5D Mark IV line or the 5D line has always been a hybrid line. That it does stills, but it also offers you the ability to shoot some really cool video. So I think the marketing fail is they didn't focus on the quality. We shoot at 45 megapixels, 12 frames a second, 20 frames per second silent, dual pixel AF that goes all the way to the edges, two card slots, all of this stuff. And oh yeah, by the way, we can do 4K up to 120. We can do 4K downsampled from 8K. And as a bonus, we can do 8K raw video internally. But as a caveat, we're gonna limit that to five to seven minutes because we don't want the camera to overheat. But the fact that we squeezed 8K into this camera, that is a primarily stills camera that does some cool video, well, that is a major win. Now, that's how I would have marketed it. I wouldn't have come out with, oh my God, it does all of this. And then you find out that it overheats and has more issues. I think people would have been more forgiving of Canon if they didn't market it the way that they did. I wanted to get a portrait of Jeremy, so I moved him over to the corner of the window. But remember, he wears those prescription sunglasses. That's part of his persona, so he has those on the whole time. But you can still kind of see his eyes behind there. Now, that's not the greatest test in the world to see how the 85 1.2 works. Somebody without glasses on would make for a better test subject. But we also have those type of images. I do have sample images of our model friend Nina with the 85 1.2 at 1 1.2 in the studio environment, so you can download those RAW files at 100 ISO to see how you like that camera and combination of that lens for portraits. Whoa, was that an elephant? Yeah, now it's time to talk about overheating. We know there was a lot of talk and a lot of videos and a lot of back and forth and a lot of press releases about the overheating in the R5 when it comes to video. But a lot of people kept asking, does that affect your still shooting? Will it overheat when you're shooting stills? And the answer is no. It did not overheat at all, whether I was shooting football in 96 degrees with like 100% humidity, it didn't overheat. Now what I did notice, and this was with firmware 1.0 before 1.1 was out, is that when I was doing stills, I could see that the clock for time for video, if I chose to shoot video, was ticking down. So the camera was getting hotter. And then Canon released an updated firmware, which did extend the time of video recording before it overheated for indoor environments. So you were able to get right around 30 to 32 minutes in 8K raw without it overheating. Now that is a big improvement over the original firmware where it overheated in like half that time or a little less than half that time. So this is a big improvement and I do expect that they will continue to improve it time and time again. 
Meanwhile, the 4K HQ mode, which we're shooting in right now, now will give us 45 minutes of continuous record time, where before it topped out around 26 minutes. Now keep in mind, those times are based on shooting indoors in about 74 degree temperature. Now when you do go outside, you are going to run into some issues when it comes to overheating if it's hot out, and you're gonna get around 20-ish minutes of record time in 4K HQ. So is this an issue? Well, in a lot of situations, the answer for video is yes. And as I mentioned earlier, Canon brought this on themselves with the way they marketed this camera. And they already knew there might be issues with record time, yet they still went ahead and focused on this as a major marketing point. Now to put this into perspective, we are recording with the camera right now in the 4K HQ mode, and it did overheat right around 43 minutes of record time. The camera has been on for over an hour at that point, so it, it could be an issue if you have to let it cool down in order to keep going. So this is something that we're aware of. Generally speaking, we're not gonna have the cameras on for hours at a time where we need Need to be recording but for something as long as this video for it to stop around 43 minutes in the 4k hq mode could pose an issue you just have to determine is that okay for your shooting environment and remember that this to me is a stills camera first that does offer you some really good video features but again you need to figure it out for yourself and hopefully canon will put out more firmware that fixes these issues if you're hoping to shoot for hours and hours and hours of time, uh, besides the overheating, which you wouldn't be able to do anyway, there is a record limit of 29.59. Now, I don't know why Canon still has this limit when this is a viable video shooting camera. You shouldn't have any limits anymore. Now this one's not a big deal when it comes to still shooters, but if you're a video shooter, Canon switched over to micro HDMI from mini HDMI. Now we would prefer to see a full HDMI for video recording because it's just a much beefier cable. And I've found that I've bent plenty of micro HDMI cables when using this camera and trying to record my EVF. However, you can record just about everything internally to the cards, so you really don't need to rely too heavily on that micro HDMI port. Let me cut in here real quick and say, would you like to take better pictures in only 11 days? Well, I created a free mini video course that you can sign up for right now at fronosphoto.com slash 11 days. So as Jeremy continued to work on his illustration, this was another good opportunity for me to focus on some details. So with the 51.2 on, I got pictures of his hands on the rollers. And this is where I'm okay to say, Jeremy, hold that. So not everything is perfectly candid all the time, but it's like, hold that for a second get my focus, take the picture, and then have him continue on. So I got about three shots that were pretty detailed in this situation, and I really liked those. But also, when he was painting that thick black on that illustration of the person's hair, I wanted to focus in on just that. So don't forget to get those extra detail shots, especially if you have these 1.2, 1.4, 1.8 lenses, they can help add and tell a better photo story. So just like where I focused on the paintbrush or the smaller pen from earlier, Jeremy broke out this really big black marker, and I'm like, I need to get a picture of just the tip of the black marker with Jeremy out of focus. So that's exactly what I did. For those video shooters out there who might find themselves vlogging with this camera or just want a different way to hit record, you no longer have to reach on top of the camera, which is this side, to hit the record button because there's a nice red button on the LCD screen. Unlike its predecessors when you were shooting in high frame rate modes, this camera now lets you use autofocus the entire time in all of those modes, including 4K 60 and 120. It's about time. 
If you're looking for a little extra reach, you can punch into Super 35 with no pixel binning, or if you throw on one of their crop sensor lenses, it will punch through that vignette and allow you to use that lens. Okay. So we did a good amount of damage in the front of the studio, but I wanted to move to the back of the studio away from the daylight and the window light coming in to try some lower light environmental portraits. So Jeremy walked around to the back, sat in his Eames lounge chair with ottoman, by the way, it's very important to have the ottoman for those Eames chairs. That is a classic, classic chair that a lot of artists have, but it was in a great position for getting Jeremy working as well as getting the art and his portraits up on the wall that he's painted. So I started off with the 11 to 24 and then realized, oh snap, it's an F4. I really need to bump my ISO up. So I went to 16,000 ISO and this is what it looks like. Now I left it in color so that you could see how the color noise looks. Now I don't see any color noise like I used to see in the older Canon cameras and Canon sensors. Now the noise that you see in the image looks like grain. It looks like what I would see when shooting film. And I'm used to noise from when I shot film. Noise to me is perfectly fine, as long as you get the shot, because it's all about getting the shot. I'd rather see you get a shot at 16,000 ISO and see a little bit of grain, than get a shot at a lower ISO, but have motion blur because your shutter speed was too slow and you didn't capture the moment. Now, if you're wondering where my noise reduction is set, well, we're looking at the raw file, so there's no noise reduction there, but I leave noise reduction totally off in all of my cameras. Now, with that being said, if I had something as simple as an 11 to 24 or a 12 to 24 2.8, I could take my ISO from 16,000, cut it in half one stop to 8,000, and now I have much less noise that it would introduce. But I was really surprised to see how well this camera handled for having 45 megapixels and shooting at a higher ISO. Since I already did the 16,000 ISO image, I wanted to go the other direction. So I lowered it to 800 ISO. It went to one tenth of a second to handhold and let the IBIS do its job. Now that's the IBIS in the camera because this lens, the 11 to 24, does not have image stabilization and it's perfectly fine at one tenth of a second because Jeremy didn't move. Now, one of the things you need to be careful with is if you're shooting a subject who's moving, it doesn't matter how good the IBIS is, the subject is still going to blur if you're shooting at a slow shutter speed. But if you're shooting inanimate objects, you should be able to handhold at really slow shutter speeds. And the IBIS in combination with the IS in the lenses will allow you to handhold at places that you could have never handheld before with other Canon cameras. So as you know, I chose to show you the 16,000 ISO image in color, but in this situation, I feel that black and white was much better because the color didn't add very much to the scene. Jeremy does a lot of paintings and drawing and illustrating in black ink. So black and white just felt right for a lot of these wider shots, especially when I switched over to the 28 to 70 F2 and got a really awesome vertical shot of him sitting on the Eames chair while working and having all of those portraits out of focus in the background, but still there. The lines are super straight and that's a testament to the 28 to 70, but also I'm shooting at F2, which means I can lower my ISO a little bit and still have a really nice fast shutter speed. One of the questions I ask myself when deciding on what camera I'm going to use for a specific shoot is, do I want to have more megapixels or be able to shoot at higher ISOs? But the truth of the matter is, in today's day and age, it kind of doesn't matter as much because high megapixel cameras are capable of going to higher ISOs that are still super clean. So honestly, I prefer having a higher megapixel camera at this point because I want more of that resolution and more of that sharpness and clarity and that better dynamic range and better color and all of the things that come with having that higher megapixel sensor. So the trade-off for me is I may not be able to bump it up super high and I may see some extra little bit of grain, but I'd rather have that than not have as much resolution. So to help make a more well-rounded photo story, I went behind Jeremy, but higher up because he's sitting down and I'm standing up and I shot over his shoulder. Now you'll notice I did the wide angle, 
Then I moved in a little closer with the zoom, and then I zoomed in all the way. See, it's about the wides, the mediums, the details, but also not cropping after the fact. I don't crop after the fact. We all know this, but this isn't a video about not cropping. It's just a recommendation that if you have the time and the ability, then you're better off shooting the wide, zooming in or stepping closer, getting the medium, going in even further and getting the detail and utilizing all of those 45 megapixels. Especially when you're shooting at higher ISOs, the more you crop at higher ISOs, the bigger the grain is going to look, which means the crappier your photo will turn out. So after doing the tests at the high ISO as well as the low ISO to give me the slow shutter speed, I stuck around 3200 to 4000. I'm generally living in that area when I'm doing these types of candids, where, whether I'm on the road or I'm with a band or with a politician in a low light area. 3200 to 4000 is perfectly acceptable and it's really acceptable in this 45 megapixel R5. Now there is a new battery that comes with this camera that finally allows you to do USB-C charging while the camera is working. Its name is right here on the screen because I can't remember it to say it perfectly, but this is the battery name. In terms of how many photos you can get on a battery charge, well, I had a battery grip on with two batteries in the camera, shot about a thousand photos during the real world review, and each battery actually trickles at the same time in that battery grip, so I was down about 30% in each battery. On the other hand, Steven used two new batteries to shoot video, and over a four hour period, he only went through a battery and a half. So after getting the over the shoulder, I saw the newspaper there that said Jeremyville Raw. And so I came to the front to get the focus with the 28 to 70 F2 right on the Raw or on his name, shooting vertical. Now my goal here is to get his name or to get that Raw in focus, but have Jeremy out of focus. You know it's him. You see the hat, you see the glasses, you see the headphones, you see the pen, you see his sketchbook. You know exactly who it is, but that image tells an incredible story. Then I wanted to go a step further and switched over to the 15 to 35 because I wanted to get wider shots, but closer. I had Jeremy hold the book out with both hands and this black and white looks really good. The sharpness on the book is perfect. The out of focus nature, even at 15 millimeters at 2.8 is great because again, you know that it's Jeremy. After getting him holding out the book horizontally, I switched over to a vertical image where he's holding the book and I focused on the book. And again, you can see that Jeremy is in the background. The pen is off to the side. You have the Eames chair there. And this was another dilemma between color and black and white, but I loved how the color felt. I liked seeing the ink in the book of the sketchbook. I like seeing the blue of his denim jacket, and I like seeing the cream color on the Eames chair. I just felt that the color was the much better option. Now I love the Q menu on the back of this camera. It allows me to quickly, from outside of the camera, without having to go through the menu system, change certain features and functions that I need to do quickly. But there's a problem. I cannot customize the Q menu. I can't put what I want inside of those boxes. Nikon lets me do that. Sony lets me do that. So why can't I do that on the Canon? I don't know. Why Canon? Why? Would you like to spice up your wardrobe and show the world that you shoot raw? Be like me. I wear I Shoot Raw shirts every day. If you'd like to pick up some I Shoot Raw shirts, head on over to store.fronosphoto.com. For those of you people, and by you people, I mean you people watching, who have more than one R5, guess what you can't do? You can't set up one camera, then save your settings to the card, to then put it in a new camera, and then upload those settings from the card to that camera. There is no save load setting function. That must be there, and Canon should make an update. One of the first things I noticed when the EOS R came out is that when the power was off and the lens was off, that the shutter came down to protect the sensor. Now, some people complain that they don't want that happening because what if something happens to their shutter? Will this hurt the life of their shutter or not? Well, in the R5, you have the option to turn that on 
or off. One thing I didn't notice until we were in the back of the studio is that Jeremy had his name and studio on the back of his denim jacket. So we went back to the front of the studio and I wanted to get some detail shots from the back to help tell the story. And you can still tell that it's Jeremy working, whether it's a wide angle shot where you get the whole table with him working and you can either see the paintbrush or the pen or you can't, or also to go a little tighter and get a vertical shot so you can see his shoes and you can see just the isolation of him in his chair, but also taking another step in closer and getting a horizontal of Jeremy working. Another cool shot I wanted to attempt to get was shooting from higher up straight down on Jeremy. Now, one thing that we could do is bring a super clamp and attach it to one of the, the rafters up above and line it up and get the shot and do it with a remote app, but we didn't have that and we didn't do that. So I set the step stool up, stepped up, then I flipped the screen out to realize that the screen doesn't get like fully open, it's on an angle. And being that it's off to the side and I'm trying to hold it like this and angled the screen, I couldn't get my lines straight. It was actually much easier for me to flip the screen back, flat on the back of the camera, hold the camera up and out while looking, I was able to get straighter lines and get this cool shot of Jeremy. But also, I thought it would be fun when Steven was getting video of me taking photos of Jeremy to get him in there as well as my feet in there on the step stool. Ideally, in the future, it would be good if I could put the camera all the way up straight above him and then remotely trigger it to get a shot straight down. Now you video shooters will like that Canon put in zebra lines into this camera. Now when Steven was shooting the real world review and he was trying to use the EVF, because he was wearing a mask, his EVF fogged up, so he had to rely on the LCD screen to get his exposure right. And because he had zebra lines, he was able to do just that. Canon has included five gigahertz Wi-Fi, which means you can now shoot wirelessly tethered to your computer. You can send raw files. You can take raw files and they go right to the computer. You take raw files, it goes right to the computer. That is pretty cool and that's where the future of photography might be going. But the last thing that I wanna have happen is somebody get in the way of those zeros and ones and I lose raw files. One of my concerns going into the real world review is how well would the autofocus work? Could I rely on the IAF and the face tracking and the lock-on tracking to get images that I otherwise would have missed without? Now, in the past, I would have been hesitant to use this full-on auto mode to help me do my shoots. But now in the R5, it was pretty spectacular. It found his face, it found his eye, it went exactly where I needed it to be, and if it didn't go where I needed it to be, I could quickly put my finger on the back of the LCD screen and move the focusing point to tell the camera where I wanted it to be. So I'm in continuous focus the entire time, and because of IAF and lock-on tracking, I can focus on composition as well as exposure, which helps me get even better shots. It's almost like there's no need to switch off into one one shot or single shot or you know where you lock in and recompose you don't really need to do that anymore so for the majority of this shoot i relied on the dual pixel af version 2. now in certain situations i switched off the focusing mode to single point continuous autofocus now i did that because jeremy was holding out a pen or holding up a paintbrush or holding up a paint pen and i wanted to focus in a specific place and that's why i moved into that mode the price of the camera is $38.99. Now is that too high? Is it too low? I was hoping for about $34.99. I thought it would be between $34.99 and $36.99. $38.99, it, it's up there. But this is a packed camera for still shooters and for video shooters. And look, if you're a pro, you're gonna make plenty of money off of a camera like this that it's worth it and it will pay for itself time and time again as long as it doesn't overheat while you're shooting video and you lose out on some jobs. Let me cut in here and say, if you're looking to purchase an EOS R5 or any gear for that matter, just look for the links down below so that you can use our affiliate link to make a purchase. Now, when you do that, it helps us to continue to make these types of videos.
To change it up, we took Jeremy out in front of his studio where there's some really cool steps as well as steel doors. Now you may remember those steps from a music video. So happens to be that it's my music video where I shoot raw, I don't crop it. Criminals, no cops. That's right, same exact steps. Now I sat Jeremy down and unfortunately a car had parked up pretty much well over the sidewalk, so I didn't have much space, but I used the 11 to 24. And what's pretty cool is that it doesn't bow too much around the edges. And I like shooting this wide, even for this type of portraits, because it shows his studio. It shows where he gets his work done, and the stairs are cool, and the leading lines of the railings, as well as he's being framed by the doorway. And to wrap up the entire shoot with Jeremy, I switched back into the 28 to 70 F2 because it's an F2. That's pretty darn cool for portraits. Plus I was at base ISO of 100 and I just went around and got some shots from the left, shots from the right, shots from a little low, shots from straight on, and just got an extra couple of portraits to finish out the entire shoot. So this was a fun shoot to do with the EOS R5. I love doing photo stories, but the only way to tell if these images are good or not is to take them back to the studio where I'm standing right now, AKA to my desk, which is right over there, to look closer and to give you my final thoughts. Guess where I am? I'm at the studio, I'm at my desk. I switch shirts on the long walk that's about 22 feet from over there to here. And I do wanna let you know that we are now recording in 8K all eye with the Canon EOS R5. Also, before we get into the images, you can download sample RAW files over on the website. The link is on the screen right now so that you can pixel peep them, do whatever you would like with them. Just don't sell them and don't call them your own. All right, let's jump into this. Let's start with some action photos. Remember when I said that I used the R5 with an adapted 402.8 version two? This is the result. This was with IAF tracking. So I locked in on his eye. It tracked him really well running across the field to catch this ball. And I love that the focus stayed right on his eyes, even with the ball right where it is. So this camera, as we know, is maybe not meant for sports, but you can totally use it for sports. And I would have no problem using it for sports because the tracking is the same that you find in the EOS R6 and very similar to what you get in the 1DX Mark III. Next, we switched over here, went horizontally, super nice contrast, super nice tones. Love the way that the file looks. Again, you can download it to see for yourself, uh, but really happy with how the files come out of the camera. I think these are some of the best Canon files that I've seen since using any of the past Canon cameras that I've done. The 45 megapixel sensor is super duper sweet. Now here is a 100 ISO sample image for you in the studio. Base ISO shooting at 1.2 with the 85 1.2 at 1 125th of a second. Now some people always say, well, Jared, why are you shooting a portrait at 1.2? You don't always need to do that or you shouldn't do that. Well, in this in this case, I wanted to make sure that the eye focus stayed in focus because sometimes you have a tendency to get eyebrow focus or it misses or as you get closer and I ran into this with the a7r4 if I got too close that the IAF just started to miss so in this case it nailed it look at the reflection in the eye look how nice and sharp it is that's just one to one let's go in three to one and here is three to one you can see the edge of her contact lens right there on her eye. Now you'd see that with other cameras as well if you zoomed in, but I just love the tones, the colors, the contrast, the raw file that I got out of this. I'm perfectly happy with the results right here. Now moving on to going to the zoo and getting a portrait of the silverback gorilla right here. This is with the 800 millimeter F11. And, and I was worried about that F11 lens. I thought it was kind of weird when they announced it. I was like, how's this gonna work? Is the background gonna be in complete focus? No, it's a pretty inexpensive lens and it's actually pretty good in bright daylight. Uh, so really happy with the portrait. Oop, we're still three to one. Wow, still in focus three to one, but really happy with what I was able to do with this in combination with the R5. Now you can see that I bumped it up to 1600 ISO because well, it's F11 and I'm only at 1 500th of a second. Oh, he's got some, he's got some grass on your forehead right there, buddy. You should just 
brush that off. Now, the next image of the Eagle is taken at 1 320th of a second, F22, 4000 ISO with a 2X converter on the 800 millimeter lens, making it 1600 millimeters. The fact that I'm able to handhold this and break all of the rules, because you're not supposed to really handhold at 1 320th of a second if you're at 1600 millimeters. Generally speaking, you want to be, if you're at 1600, you want to be around 1 1600th of a second or 1 2000th of a second to counteract any movement or motion. But in this case, we have IS in the lens and we have image stabilization in the body and we can zoom in. Actually, let me go here and use Skittles, the preset, because boom, one click, Skittles does this, and I actually want to warm it up just a little bit. If, if you want to check out the presets again, you can go to fronosphoto.com slash fropack2. Check out the bundle. You can get fropack1 and 2. But zooming in here, is it perfectly sharp? I mean, it's pretty darn close right here. And remember, we're at 1600 millimeters and I'm hand holding at 1 320th of a second. We are filling the frame immensely and I think it did a great job. Now, if you're new here and you didn't see the videos that I did prior, this is not an issue with the camera, these lines in the background. This is the fence that's in the back that keeps the eagle from flying over to my hair and thinking that it's a nest. But really happy with what I was able to do at 1600 millimeters handheld. Oh, and Steven asked me this question. He's like, what did it look like through the viewfinder? It was still, it was as still as could be. I mean, it's not easy to get 1600 millimeters, especially when you're breathing, but it was really stable. And you just lock those elbows in, hold it out like this, eye up to the EVF and you're good. Don't be one of those people that tries to hand hold the camera like this while using the LCD screen. It's not gonna work at all. Moving on, we've got little Daniel here outside at 1.2. So as you can see, I did a lot of testing with this camera in a lot of different situations and scenarios from the action to the portraits to the candids to the uh, photojournalistic type of things. So we did quite a lot with it. But little Daniel outside, uh, I want to use ACDC in here just to pump him up right off the bat with one click. That's from Fropack 2. But really, look at this. 1.2, it found his eye, locked onto him, and he runs around quite a bit. But look at this. The color looks really good once we, we tweaked it. Right out of the camera, this is what it looks like. It's a little, it was overcast, but tweaking it, boom, 100 ISO, base ISO at 1.2, 1 800th of a second. 85 1.2 is a masterful lens. I love those RF lenses, and I really like this image. Moving on to the next one of Little Daniel. I wish that I was centered a little more, but he doesn't stand still very well because he's a little kid. But I just wanted to show you that I was able to get the eye nice and perfect again at 1.2. Now, sometimes in situations like this, I want to get, say, the, he calls them balls, but they're actually tomatoes. I would want him to hold one out and focus on that. That's where I would switch off of the eye detect and the face detect because I wouldn't be able to focus in on something being held out. That's where I quickly change to single point AF, but in continuous autofocus. So I pick that point, move my thumb quickly on the back of the screen, right to what I want to have in focus and take the picture. That's just like what I did with Jeremy when he was holding out the paintbrush. That's what you need to do because you basically have to turn off the face detect in order to to get that type of shot, but happy with those results. And now we move in to the last batch, which is uh, Jeremy in his studio. I love this with the 11 to 24. I hope they replace the 11 to 24 soon, but this one I just loved in black and white. I felt it shows you his entire table. Look how, you know, Yes, he's pretty small behind the table, but it's a massive table. You can see art over here to the right. You can see that he's working on a new piece of art. You have the studio in the background. I think that it worked because the ceilings are black, the poles are white, the, 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 the refinished wood looks very good. And I just think it's one of those artistic images that works. But also without doing any lens correction, the lines are pretty damn straight. Uh, straight out of the camera. You could always try lens correction if you so wanted. This was one of those where we talk about having the out of focus area. And look, we're at 15 millimeters with that 15 to 35 2.8. People sometimes feel like, oh, you can't get out of focus things at 15. Well, you totally can. IAF, right to Jeremy's eye. He took off his glasses so that he could focus in on painting right down here on this painting. But 
being that he, he always wears his glasses except for when he's getting close to this, you could see that the glasses are still part of it because he's holding them. So I love the out of focus book, the out of focus uh, coffee mug, all of those things that draw you into the image. And we're only at 400 ISO and it looks perfectly fine. If you're watching this video, it's probably because you have some camera gear. Well, have you downloaded my app called My Gear Vault? It's the best way to input, organize, and protect your gear. And it's absolutely free for iOS as well as Android. So head on over to mygearvault.com to give it a download. All right, this is where we moved to the back where we're at 16,000 ISO at 1 1 60th of a second. Is there noise? Absolutely. This is noise. That's what you're going to get at 16,000 ISO. Is it usable? The answer, Steven? Yeah. Yeah, the answer is yes. Because if you were to print this in a book or a magazine or put it on the web, nobody's going to be like, oh my God, you shot this at 16,000 ISO. The uh, the, uh, the grains, oh my God, the structure, it's just so bad. Stop overthinking it. Would I normally shoot at 16,000? No, I did it for this review. And as I said, when we talked about this picture earlier, if I had a 2.8 or an F2, I would already be at only 8,000. I generally don't go much further past 8,000 because I don't have a need to. But if you needed to with this camera, this is showing you that you could get it done and still have great results and be happy with what you get. One of my most favorite images is this one of Jeremy working in his book. You have the nice pictures in the background that he painted. It's even funny because it's like this one is looking right at him while he's looking there drawing. You have the Eames Lounge and the Ottoman, which is important to getting both of them in there. There's actually a picture that I took before, actually a bunch of them I took before, where I cut off the edge of the Ottoman and I realized it while I was shooting, I'm like, nah, nah, nah. You can't cut off the edge of that ottoman. You need to put a little separation from the ottoman to the edge of the frame. And that's why I got this shot. And I just, I, I loved that I was able to do that because that's a cool one. Um, really enjoy this image. Again, with the, six, uh, the 15 to 35, the image before this was the 28 to 70. Straight, gorgeous lines, super sharp lens. But I like this one in color versus black and white because we see the drawing, you have the subtle color of the hands, the cream of the, uh, the, the Eames Lounge, and Jeremy in color in the background, I think, just, I, I think just makes it pop really well. And then to round out the sample images right here, I wanted to be able to get that shot from up above, but without putting a super clamp up in the ceiling or rigging it up somehow and using the remote app, I used the step stool and decided to take a picture of my feet in it because I'm like, well, Steven's here shooting me, shooting photos of Jeremy, and I actually think it helps tell the story inside of the story because honestly, we are part of the story because we're reviewing this gear. Jeremy's the story because he's the artist that we're photographing, and Steven is helping get all of this done for the real world review. So he's using the R5, I'm using the R5, I didn't flip the screen out for this one, and that's why the lines are, well, they're lined up with the table. I'll give myself that. They're lined up with the table, but down here you can see that it's not perfect with the floor. It is super darn close. But again, you can download the sample raw files so that you can see them for yourselves. I, I'm really happy with the results that we got from the stills. I love the stills. The quality of the video is really good as well. So. Who is this camera for? This is a jack of all trades type of camera. If you're a wedding photographer, if you do portraits, if you like to do action and photojournalism, you could do everything with this camera. Personally, at $3,899, it's a little more expensive than where the 5D Mark IV was at around $3,400, $3,500 when it first came out. But I do suspect that there will be rebates at some point to drop the price to $300 to make the purchase when they can actually have actual stock in stock and, and get them out into the world. This is a well-rounded camera. If you just do stills, it's going to be fantastic. If you want to do video, it's going to be fantastic with a caveat. Right now, the overheating can be an issue. When we were recording the real world review, the stand up portion over there, we had two times where it overheated and we had to stop. Now we did have the camera on continuously in live view in 4K HQ for 
about an hour and 20 minutes, and Stephen was starting and stopping as we went over different parts. So we got 43 minutes of actual record time before it overheated, and the on time, even without recording and recording, the total was roughly an hour and 20 minutes. Is that good enough? Well. No, I mean, if you're shooting weddings, if you're doing long form types of video, it's possible that it's not in those, in those types of environments. Hopefully, Canon gets firmware out to fix it and go even further to allow us to use it for much further without having it shut down and hit double zeros. Luckily for us, we had extra cameras waiting for us in the refrigerator so that we could just pull them out and shoot with them whenever we needed to. 43 minutes of record time is good, but that doesn't negate the fact that there is an overheating issue. And if you need it for longer, it might be an issue right now. Shorter types of recording, the quality is fantastic. The autofocus is fantastic. Just about everything about this camera is fantastic. And again, we are doing 8K on this, not raw, and we're about 16 minutes into recording and it hasn't overheated just yet. So that's who the camera is for. But the other question is, Will I switch from using the Sony a7R4 and the Sony a9 II to come to something like the R5 and the R6? And the answer is no, not right now. I don't think I wanna be in this ecosystem at this point. If you already own Canon gear and you've been waiting for something like this, there's no reason to switch to the Sony because Canon has done a masterful job for the stills and of course for the video to give you something that has tremendous autofocus, great quality with 45 megapixels, tons of speed, just a really well put together camera. But I'm not at the point where I would wanna switch. I switched from Nikon to go to the Sony about a year ago and I'm sticking with the Sony right now for me when it comes to stills because I think it's the right tool for what I'm doing. The lenses are lighter, even though I never used to complain about weight of cameras and weight of lenses, I just really like for run and gunning having the lighter lenses, the lighter body, a little bit more customizable, and I think the autofocus still has an edge over the Canon. Gee, if I only had a EOS R5 and all these great RF lenses, could I do it? The answer is absolutely. I could take this camera into the real world, like I've already shown you here, and get really good results and not feel like that the technology is holding me back, that I'm missing things. But when it comes to video, we are actually considering switching from the Z6s that we used or have been using in the studio here to switching over to the R5 for many different reasons. The, the concern is the overheating but we don't generally shoot super duper long videos when we're here. We don't do super long takes where we have to really worry about it, except when we're doing these real world reviews. We love the autofocus. We love all the things that we talked about. So we are considering getting rid of the Z6s from Nikon and using in the studio the R5 for our video needs. So at the end of the day, Canon did a fantastic job getting out what they got out with the R5, especially being super late to the game and having to reinvent their entire system and their entire world. Good job, Canon, on doing the still side of it. Good job on the quality of the video. Not such a good job when it came to marketing. But at the end of the day, this is a solid, solid, I think, masterful camera. So let me know what you guys think down below. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And that's where I'm gonna leave it. Jared Polin, Fronosphoto.com. See ya.